That Sunday evening, I began a lesson about what is sometimes simply called the AD 70 theory. And the reason we talked about it was because it has so much to do with Paul's second letter to the church at Thessalonica. And we mentioned some this morning, we mentioned some last Sunday morning. These were young Christians who had been given some bad information about the second coming of Christ. Some had been told there that Christ had already came and they had missed it. And while we think that's a, that's a very unusual thing to, to even believe, let alone teach, that teaching has been in the Lord's church for nearly 40 years now in places. And so, because it has so much to do with our sermons on Sunday morning, <clears throat> we looked at part of it last week and we'll finish it up tonight. It is a, a rather deep subject, but uh, I think we can look at it and, and come to understand what's being taught and actually compare it to what the Bible teaches. You know, as we mentioned this morning, that's what's critical. Comparing what we hear or read with the truth of the Bible. And so that is our responsibility. That's our job. That's what we need to be doing with everything. One thing I mentioned last Sunday night was that this particular teaching <clears throat> redefines a lot of very common words. And last week we looked at the second coming of Christ and how the teaching of, of this particular theory completely contradicts what Jesus and some apostles taught about the second coming of Christ. And so tonight we're going to look at two other parts that are very important. And they're very important to us because, as I mentioned last Sunday night, our belief about the second coming of Christ and the resurrection affects how we behave, affects how we live. So that's important. It's important for everybody then to have a correct view of the second coming of the resurrection of the end of the world of Judgment Day. Because a, a, a teaching that's false leads to all kinds of problems. And it has for people who has followed this. Many people have quit the church and quit living moral, spiritual lives when they come to believe this. And you'll see why tonight. Because they see there's no reason for it. The resurrection. <clears throat> Most of us in here probably have read and, and heard lessons and studied about the resurrection and have a good knowledge of what the resurrection is. But when people who follow this particular teaching talk about the resurrection, they are not talking about the resurrection that you and I know about. And that is why we have to understand what they're talking about. It's very, very important. Because when they use the word resurrection, they're talking about the resurrection of the church. Not the resurrection of our bodies, but the resurrection of the church. So when they look at these passages, some of which we'll look at tonight, they talk about the resurrection. And there are so many. A few in the Old Testament, but many of them in the New Testament. All of those places that talk about the resurrection, they believe it was the resurrection of the church in AD 70. And you'll say, the resurrection of the church from what? Their belief is based upon this concept. That even though the church was started <clears throat> in the early AD 30s, that it was essentially dead and buried until AD 70. In other words, it was buried under Judaism. Judaism had buried it in the ground, and the church was dead. And not until A.D. 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed, was the church resurrected. And so in all the passages in the New Testament, that's how they interpret the word resurrection. They do not believe, none of the people that follow this teaching believe in the resurrection of our bodies. None of them believe that at all. They believe that though that resurrection is entirely talking about the church being buried under Judaism and then resurrected from it. 
Basically, they teach that the church rose from the grave of Judaism. Now, is there any way to interpret any of those verses in that way? Absolutely not. I mean, there is just no way you can read the Old or New Testament and come up with that. In other words, you have to practice putting things into the text instead of taking things out. You know, we talk about exegesis, being taking things out of the text, what it says, coming out from its meaning. Eisegesis means putting things in. And that's what's done with this theory. And like I said, you don't have to go far from here to find churches of Christ who practice and believe this particular theory. Well, first of all, let's go to Daniel chapter 12. This is the only place in the Old Testament we'll go, and the rest of the time we'll spend in the New Testament. But Daniel chapter 12, and read with me just one verse, all we have to read. Well, I think a couple verses, actually. Daniel chapter 12, and we will read <coughs> verses <coughs> 2 and 3. Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> verse 2 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So my first question is, could that possibly ever be understood as being the resurrection of the church? Well, there, there is no way you could ever get that from that verse. It's very obvious what that's talking about, isn't it? Uh, it's very obvious what it's talking about. It's talking about a literal, it's talking about a bodily resurrection of individuals. I mean, that's the obvious context and that's the obvious understanding. has nothing to do with the resurrection of the church from Judaism. Now, New Testament. First of all, Matthew chapter 22 <clears throat> We want to see what Jesus thought about the resurrection. Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 30, 23. The same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. See, there were people in the first century who said there was no resurrection of the body. Came to him and asked him saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, now they didn't believe in the resurrection. They were trying to trick him. Whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, when we read that text, is there any way possible that he was talking about the resurrection of the church under Judaism in A.D. 70? Not a chance. Doesn't make the slightest bit of sense. But yet, the followers of this teaching believe that's exactly what it's talking about. Did Jesus believe in the resurrection of the dead? Yes. Did he believe in the resurrection of individuals? Yes, because he talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were individuals. They weren't even in the church, were they? So it's impossible for that verse to have anything to do with the resurrection of the church in AD 70. We move to John chapter 5. <clears throat> this is another familiar text you'll recognize. This is, these are the words of Jesus. <clears throat> Verse 28. Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come forth, those who've done good to the resurrection of life, and those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That's hard to misunderstand. I mean, I, I don't know 
what age you would have to be, but I would think a sixth or seventh grader could easily understand the meaning of those words. It is so obvious what it's talking about. The word all there in the Greek is plural. All those who are in the graves. All of them. Who's in the graves? Are there a bunch of churches in the graves? Well, of course not. There's individuals in the grave. There, there's bodies in the grave. There aren't churches in the grave. Certainly not talking about the resurrection of churches. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we want to, to understand this because it has divided many congregations. Many churches have divided over this teaching. You, and you, you wonder, well, how can anybody believe this? I really don't have the answer to that. When it's so obvious the Bible doesn't teach it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice first of all verses 3 and 4. Paul writes, For I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, before we read any further, what kind of resurrection is he talking about there? He's talking about the resurrection of Christ from the grave, right? A literal bodily resurrection. All right, keeping that in mind, now skip down to verse 12. <clears throat> now, if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? See, there were some there that didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, how can you believe that? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. And it's interesting there that in the original, when he talks about the resurrection of the dead, it's plural. It's the resurrection of the dead ones. It's the resurrection of the dead ones. He says, if people aren't raised from the dead, people, individuals then Christ wasn't raised from the dead either. Wow. That's, that's quite an implication, isn't it? The resurrection talked about in the New Testament, place after place after place, talks about a literal bodily resurrection. Jesus says on that day, He says don't marvel because on that day, all who are in their graves, all of them, it didn't make any difference where they were buried or how they died or anything. He says, everyone is going to come forth from the graves. And then when we look at 1 Corinthians 15, we know that that body is going to be changed when it comes out of the grave. So, it can live eternally somewhere. That body is going to be changed as it comes from the grave. But Jesus said, don't marvel because it's going to happen. Says, no, it has nothing to do with so-called resurrection of the church in AD 70, which makes no sense at all. And when you correspond with, with people who believe this, and David and I have been involved, him a lot more than I have in this, you're amazed. You are just absolutely amazed how people twist scriptures to come up with this. Why? I have no idea. Because it's a very sad, depressing belief. There's no resurrection. That's what they believe. There's no resurrection. How awful. And then the second and last thing, and there's so much we could talk about, but just there's no way with the time, and that's Judgment Day. Again, <clears throat> people who believe this teaching believe in a Judgment Day, but not the Judgment Day the Bible teaches. Not at all. We mentioned last, last week Max King, the preacher in Ohio that kind of started this uh, theory way back in the early 70s. In his books, and remember I mentioned two of them that he had written, he teaches the judgment day mentioned in the New Testament, like Second Peter chapter 3 that we'll read in a minute, is the judgment upon the Jewish world only. And so when the Bible in the New Testament talks about the judgment day, it is talking solely and strictly and exclusively about what happened in A.D. 70. 
That was the last judgment day that will ever happen, according to them. There is no more judgment days to occur. So when we go to 2 Peter chapter 3, and we read, beginning in verse 5, <clears throat> these are Peter's words, beginning in verse 5 and following, he says, For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, <clears throat> by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so when you go to their writings, they say that's talking about what happened to the Jewish world in A.D. 70. How could you ever get that out of those verses? Well, you have to put it in there. That has to come from your own ideas. It's not comes from the Bible at all. What happened to the days of Noah? What happened when the world was flooded? Was the world flooded or was just a small part of the world? Was it just the Jewish world that was flooded? Well, we know, go back and read Genesis chapter 6, we know exactly what happened. The whole world was flooded. This was a universal judgment. Why would Peter go back and use a universal judgment of the flood to talk about a local judgment upon the Jews in A.D. 70. Again, doesn't make any sense. It's, it's very poor interpretation. It's a very poor uh, way of looking at God's Word. <clears throat> so their belief is there will not be a judgment when everybody appears before God. They do not believe that that, that will ever, ever happen. <clears throat> when we go back to Matthew chapter 12, this is the, these are the words of Jesus. And this is important for us to know as well. Very important. Beginning in verse 41. <clears throat> Jesus says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Um, my question is, did the Lord resurrect the people of Nineveh in AD 70? Well, of course he didn't. But it says right there that on Judgment Day, the people of Nineveh will rise up. So if they didn't rise up in A.D. 70, then he's not talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. That one verse should completely destroy the teaching that Judgment Day was in A.D. 70 and there will be no more. Moving on to Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. <clears throat> Paul writes to the church in Rome, <clears throat> But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Did that happen in A.D. 70? Well, of course it didn't. Nothing even vaguely like that happened in A.D. 70. I know it didn't because I wasn't alive in A.D. 70. And it says that all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, if that was judgment day, I wasn't there. And I should have been, if that was really the judgment day. All will stand before the judgment seat. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Did everybody on the face of the earth bow down to Christ in AD 70? No, they didn't. Did every tongue confess God in AD 70? No, it did not. So Judgment Day was not in A.D. 70 in any sense of that word. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. A couple more verses and we'll be done. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. You've heard this many, many times. Paul writes, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Did everyone receive what they were due in A.D. 70? Well, that's what it says in that verse. 
It says very clearly, right? That, that's not hard to understand. That verse is pretty plain, pretty straightforward. Everyone did not receive what they were due in AD 70. There is a coming judgment that has nothing whatsoever to do with the Jews or the Jewish world or Jerusalem or AD 7 or anything like it. None of that has anything to do with the judgment day that you and, all, you and I are going to have to experience where we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It has nothing to do with the Jewish world or Jerusalem or AD 7 or anything. There is a coming judgment day. And then lastly, Revelation chapter 20. Briefly. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 10. It says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw... A great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, according to this teaching, all of those things happened in AD 70. In other words, Satan is no longer roaming this earth doing anything or, or has any effect in the world. Satan was thrown into the lake of fire already back in AD 70. It's done with him. It's hard to believe anybody would teach that. But yet, many people are caught up in this teaching. Why, I don't know, because there's there's just nothing in it. Were all the lost thrown into the lake of fire in AD 70? That's what it says in those verses. If that was really judgment day, then all the lost were thrown into the lake of fire. Every one of them. That's what it says. Satan and death. You notice death is right there in those verses. If Judgment Day was in A.D. 70, death was destroyed in A.D. 70, and we've not had death since then. This is something they simply can't get around. Death was destroyed in A.D. 70, according to their teaching, if they accept the implications of their teaching. And, of course, none of those things happened then. None of them. Many other parts of the teaching could be looked at, the end of the world and so forth. But I think any honest, sincere heart has to understand that the AD 70 theory is false. And I hope if people, you know, listen to this or, or watch this, whatever, uh, in the future, they will understand what the truth of the gospel is and they'll give up this false teaching because it's a very false teaching. There's no point in having baptism anymore, is there? Of course not. Wouldn't be any point in it. If Judgment Day already happened, then baptism has no effect. What we did this morning in observing the Lord's Supper, we're supposed to observe it until what? He comes again, right? Well, if He came in A.D. 70, then there's no point in having the Lord's Supper. And many of the people who believe this don't. They quit having the Lord's Supper. Don't have it anymore. Because there's no point in it. It's all happened. Same way about marriage. You know, when there's not supposed to be marriage after Judgment Day, correct? We read that a few minutes ago. Well, then we have no right to get married today. If Judgment Day was in AD 70, no one's had any right to get married since AD 70. Not a single person. Sometimes it's the best way to look at a teaching is to see what it implies. If it implies something false, then the teaching is false. And certainly that's true with this. There's hardly anything in this theory that's true. There's hardly anything in it that follows God's Word. It's all man's ideas that for some reason, and I couldn't possibly comprehend why anybody would ever want to believe this, but they, they have put these ideas in the New Testament 
and twisted the New Testament and even some of the Old in such a way that it's hard to imagine. It's just hard to imagine. There is going to be a judgment day. Everybody is going to be judged. We don't know when that day is, but it's in the future. It hasn't happened yet. We're all going to have to answer for what we've done, good or bad. The books are going to be open. Those whose names are in the book of life will spend eternity in heaven with Christ. Those whose names are not will be cast into that lake of fire where the devil and his angels, the false prophet, are tormented day and night forever. The Bible is very clear about what's going to happen on Judgment Day. Therefore, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to other people, not just ourselves. We have a responsibility to teach them what God's Word actually says in, in, and teach them in whatever way we can because it's very serious what they believe, what people believe about judgment and about eternal life.